the New Testament there. Let's get this. So let you folks know, we're going to go in after uh, teaching about 8.30 when we finish up here. Uh, we're going to go into the time in Afterglow. And so Calvary Kids Club is still going to be going on. And uh, you are welcome to join us. But if you want to fellowship and talk, please go way down the hallway by over where the food used to be. Uh, there might be a spring roll left. And, uh, save all the shellfish for Alex. Because that will be fun to watch. That's it, man. He probably won't get to see Jesus sooner, but uh, he'll want to. <laughs> he'll, he'll want to. Hey, turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Ephesians. And uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this evening. And that God, that we can uh, come before you and worship you and give you all the glory that is truly due your name. So, Lord, may we leave here tonight more on fire, more convicted, more committed, more submitted, more in love with you than when we came here this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. And he and you, who's that you? Use the you. Verse 1, chapter 2, the book of Ephesians, as we're continuing our study through here. Page 1702. You there? All right. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Quickened, made right. You got things together. He's shored you up. He, is, uh, he has built you as a found, He's built a foundation. We know that He is the foundation. Uh, again, going through chapter 1, uh, the first three chapters of Ephesians, or just about any letter from the Apostle, or you know, an epistle from the Apostle Paul, the first half is doctrine. It's teaching. It's really setting you up so you have a foundation, and you have a basis, and you have an understanding of what He's going to. Uh, to be telling us and what he's going to be sharing with us and really giving us in the context. And so when you've studied through chapter 1, you've seen about the will of God. He throws out a word like principalities and he's setting you up because if you've read ahead, you know he's going to be talking about about chapter 6. And he's given us a foundation of these things that we can understand doctrinally. Doctrine means teaching. And by having this instruction, by having this understanding, then we can apply it. And so you see the will of God. And remember, he wants you to know the will of God. Hopefully this week you took my encouragement and you've eradicated from your vocabulary, from your vernacular, from your lexicon of words, God works in mysterious ways. No, we're clueless. But God does not work in mysterious ways. They are blatant, overt, and he wants us to know. So you do your own spiritual inventory. If I don't know what's going on, it's me who's clueless. Take notes, if you're taking notes and understand this, Job never had the benefit of chapter 1 until he was with the Lord. And look what he did. And so we can look at Job as an example in the days of old and understand that here's a guy who did not have the benefit of chapter 1 that God was bragging on him. He did not have the benefit of the chapter 1 that God says, hey, Satan, check this guy out. And, and, And yet Job did not like the day he was born, didn't want to be, didn't... But understand, he did not have the benefit. And that's my counsel when people come to me. I don't understand. That's your chick. I don't understand. Okay. What do you need to understand? You were going to hell. And you're not going to suffer for all eternity separation from God. You know, eternity without Jesus, that's hell. So what do we need to talk about today? Oh, man, you're kind of... Bottom line, pretty. I mean, I've got all these owies and boo boos and, and yogis, and I got all this stuff going on, and and you're just like, because really the context I have is besides going to hell, what really problems do you have? I'm sure there's pain. I'm sure there's suffering. We, Jesus Christ promised that. So I understand this thing about His will and what's going on there, and I want to understand that. And that's really what I deal with in my own life, in your life, and in Christians' lives. I just want to know that will of God. Why? So you can disobey it? (laughs) I want to know what the perfect, pleasing will of God is so I can go the other way. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Adam, of all the trees in the garden you can partake of, there's one. Where is it? I want to make sure I don't, uh, you know, stumble across. I I just need to know. There's nothing different 
between the old Adam, but there's something different with you and I who have the new Adam, with Jesus Christ. So he sets us up in chapter 1 about the will of God. Look at verse 9 of chapter 1. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. So if I'm not understanding the mystery of his will, when I come up against something I don't know, I need to fall back on what I do know. Job's a good example of that. Isaiah's a good example of that. For those of you who have your children in CKC tonight, they're going to go through Isaiah 53. They're going to be talking about the suffering Messiah. They're going to be talking about Jesus Christ. And so you need to have an answer and be ready for them about why suffering and why God allows suffering and why suffering is actually good for us. And, and then you're able to take passages in the Bible that says it's the Father's good pleasure to crush the Son. Why? Because then you and I get salvation. We know that. How come it's okay for, the, for God the Father to crush His Son and it'd be a good pleasure, but you and I can't suffer? I mean, I'm looking around. I've looked in the mirror this morning. I've looked around every night. I, Jesus is the only perfect one. And if He didn't escape suffering, what makes you and I think we're better than that? And so here's the thing that it comes down to, it, that He wants to, verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. There's things that are just beyond our capability to understand right now, right now in finite mind and our understanding. But what you do understand of God and what you do understand about the grace of God and what you do understand about the love of God, live that out. I get inundated with emails and questions and calls and what about this and what about that and what about this and like well first tell me what do you know about God and his love and his mercies what do you know about escaping from all eternity from damnation of hell what do you really know does your relationship with God make you sure that you'll go to heaven when you die first let me diagnose where you're at when it comes to that and then we start dissecting the problems in these things so Paul really lays it out for us here in Ephesians chapter 2. And you, so again, you go through chapter 1, and then chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you he hath quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now the sins means to miss the mark. We know that. You, if you come in here for, any, for more than 30 seconds, you know that an archery term, the King James English sin, to miss the mark. It's still, I checked it out when I went to the UK, when I went to London. It's still a term used to this day. A fag is a cigarette over there as well, but they're not that politically correct. To hear someone, hey, they're just talking about fag this and fag that, I'm just going, well, they're not politically correct. And they're talking about a cigarette. They still use that term to this day. They still use the word sin to miss the mark when it comes to an archery term. And when we are away from God, we are sinning. We're always going to miss the mark of God. But then he covers us with this, but dead in your trespasses, trespasses, willful premeditated, I know that I know that I know what I'm doing here. Rebellion, premeditated, predetermined disobedience to that which you know to be true. Now, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to God, that trespass is that you premeditated, you know that those things are wrong. So we can be sinning because many people say, well, I didn't ask to be born. Why do I have to accept a God and be forgiven of sin? I mean, I didn't ask to be born. Well, okay, you're here now. What are you going to do about it? Now, you don't have to be in, in angry towards God. You can receive it. But then there's this trespass, a premeditated willful disobedience to that which is revealed to you. So we're covered either way by him sinning in ignorance. And God is going to make known his mystery. Many people, again, just share with me and say, well, I just don't understand. I'm just doing things and I, I just don't see any conviction in that person's life. Well, what makes you think they're not convicted? What makes you think the Holy Spirit cannot reach that person? Because that is the paraclete. That is the para alongside of the Holy Spirit convicting the world of sin. That's one of the responsibilities of the Holy Spirit. And contrary to what you might hear on some of the radio and some of the speakers I've been hearing before, they're talking about the Holy Spirit leaves with the rapture of the church and, sends it, and there's no more Holy Spirit here because it's in the church. No. The Holy Spirit that's in you and I, we raptured, we're out. But the Holy Spirit will still be on this earth and will still be what? convicting men and women of their sins. Because that conviction will bring us closer to the Lord. That conviction draws us closer. That conviction is that of that unction, that conviction. But condemnation pushes, that up, pushes us away. So you, he hath quickened. You and I, believers, not pagans, 
not wannabes, not the posers, you and I, believers. And this is the thing when it comes down to, have we forgotten? Have I forgotten? I've been quickened. I've been set apart. I've been these things that the Holy Spirit has done, that Jesus Christ has done in my life. And we were dead in our trespasses, in our sins. Verse 2, we're in time past. You walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the ear, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. If you're doing your spiritual inventory, are you still walking in that? That might be an identifying mark that maybe he's not in you. Could be. Or that there's the, that carnality. That you're no longer, that there's still no struggle. There's no, there's no conviction there. There's nothing that's truly happening in your life. And so here's the thing, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So do your own spiritual inventory. Do I identify as a child of disobedience or do I identify with someone who used to walk in those ways, used to do those things? I no longer have to do those things. This is the Apostle Paul setting this up doctrinally so we can get to chapters 4, 5, and 6. You already know if you've read ahead that he's talking about the principalities and stuff, but you're not going to be able to go in and appropriate. You're not going to be able to go, you and I together, we cannot do the things that God has called us to do when it comes to the spiritual realm because we have no ability to wear that armor of God. There are principalities, there are powers, there are spiritual forces, there is darkness, there is a devil. There is an enemy. There are fallen angels. There are spiritual minions. There are things that are trying to mess up your life. Because remember, as a believer, for the believers here tonight, the Holy Spirit's not into time sharing. You can't be demon possessed as a believer. You can't be. It's just impossible. But you can be oppressed and you can open yourself up and you can be harassed. You can do those things. And there can be the impression that you can be demon possession or something like that. But so what can the enemy do? Well, he can't have you back. Can't take you to hell. But it's going to trip you up. I know personally, it's going to trip you up. So you don't lead anyone else to Jesus Christ. I mean, if he can't have you back, he's going to do anything he can to, to neutralize you. Now, as a, a student of war, Sun Tzu wrote, uh, wrote the thing on the art of war, you know, to divide and conquer. Well, that's just demonically inspired. We already know. I mean, the devil's already been using that. And so here... He tells us here, when times pass, you walked according to the course of this world. If there's still the things of the course of this world that you're attracted to, that you're desiring those things, then there's going to be disobedience in your life. This isn't Chick the Fanatic telling you this. It's just Chick the Fanatic reminding you of this of what the Apostle Paul said. That's just the other thing, that I'm under the same thing, that, that worketh, and that worketh, that, that's in the children of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Again, another identifying mark. Now, this is an antiquated term, conversation. So, I mean, New King James will have it. This word conversation doesn't just mean your speech. It means your conversation means your whole manner of life. That's what this word conversation, your whole manner of life means is speaking as well. But your whole manner of life, in other words, live every day as if Jesus Christ is coming back today, but make plans like you're never going to die. Preach the gospel every day, the good news of Jesus Christ. And if it's absolutely, positively necessary, use words. My whole manner of life should bespeak. You like that? I've been reading a lot of King James lately. Should bespeak should be filled, should be overflowing with Jesus. Now, it's something that, again, starting off and walking and, and doing those things, you're appropriating, those things are coming to you. They're not instantaneously. He instantaneously saves us. We're going to see that here with, boom, we're saved. We're going to be with Jesus. We have the promise of eternal life. But he works with us over the course of time. Over the course of time. Among whom also we had our conversation, our whole manner of life. It, in other words... These things should be the identify, identification of the old life, of the old way, even from just last week. In other words, there's, as I was ministering last night in the jail, as I tell everybody, you, 
You do not have to stop having sex outside of marriage. You don't have to stop doing weed. You don't have to stop doing all kinds of sins. You don't have to stop cheating on taxes. You don't have to do any of those things to come to Jesus. Just come to Jesus just as you are. Now, for you and I have been on the other side of the cross, we know that's pretty mean because how are you going to try doing that after the Holy Spirit's in you? I already know that. It's self-governing. I don't have to really tell anybody to do the simple Now, you've got to stop this. You've got to stop that. You've got to stop that. I don't have to do that. There's already enough things the Holy Spirit's in my life. You've got to stop this, you've got to stop that. You know, and he's helping me on that. I, I can't really focus upon you. But come to Christ, surrender your life to Christ, and things are just going to change because the Holy Spirit now is in your life. The Holy Spirit is indwelling you. And now the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you. And just like Romans 2, 4, it is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. And so we see here, these are identifying marks. That's doctrinally. Do you, if you haven't caught it by now, hopefully you get in right now and I'm explaining it to you. That's what the Apostle Paul is setting us up for. These things should be your former life. That's, that's what they are doing. Like That's what the world is going on. That is the course of the world. This is, they just go right along, whatever what they're doing. They have to do those things. Among whom also we all had. So you circle that word. Had, had been part of. That was an identifying mark. Had our conversation, our whole manner of life in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Verse 4. But, I love that. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Notice what it doesn't say. But, because we were so awesome, People like us, we're wonderful, we're born with a really good personality and a positive self-mental image. Jesus says, you know what, I'll die for that person because they're worthy. It is because of his love. You can cross-reference this with 1 John. It's because he first loved us, not because we loved him. Because he first loved us. But God who is rich in mercy, this is like Brother Buck has said, you know, is that we can't out God's grace. Try. You can't get on beyond God's grasp. You can't get, you can't out God's grace because he's rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us because of his love. You know, there's something that God can't do. I'm just going to tell you the impossible thing God can't do. Oh, here comes the heresy. He can't stop loving us. That's what God can't do. He just, it's, it's his love. I can depend upon it. I can bank on it. I can disobey and be abusive of God's grace and his love and his mercy. I can be contemptuous of it, but I know that God's love is there. Now I'm going to pay some consequences on some other things. But his love is there. And it's rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us. That's the identifying mark of God. And so, verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, you are partially saved. He, even while I was still in sin, Jesus Christ still died on the cross, you know, almost 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, man. My sins were still yet future. The things that I did, the things that I said, the things that I blasphemed, and everything, but by His grace, we are seated. We are we are saved. Saved from what? That's the whole thing, folks. Don't get away from this. You're saved from hell. You're saved from eternal damnation. You know, if, if there is not a God who judges sin, then how can there be a God who just loves you? There has to be a qualifying mark that goes on there. A guy the other day says, oh, I'm in the jail. He goes, oh, man, it's so good to see you. You know, 10 years ago when I was here, you saved me. My response to him, I didn't tell him this. My response, you know, I was trying to get to him later, but we're in the middle of singing. And I was like, going, I'm pretty sure I did save you. But if Jesus would have saved you, you probably wouldn't be in jail today. You know, oh, I'm so glad to see that. And I'm just handing my card. Hey, see me out in town. See me out in town. See me out in town. Here you go. Oh, man, it's so good. I was having a bummer day today, but seeing you today, and I couldn't believe it. When I saw you, just really rejoiced. You're happy to see me in jail? I'm, I'm making it comfortable here for you? Oh, yeah. I mean, those are the conversations. So who really has saved you? By grace you are saved. 
even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ. I did nothing for this. Understand, we're going chapter by chapter. We've already got chapter 1 down. Let me go back and read it. By his will, he's making known this mystery. And then that way we can tell people when that statement comes up. And I've said it, you've said it, but don't say it anymore. You know, God works in mysterious ways. No, tell them. No, he doesn't. He loves you. And it's obvious right there. Jesus did not get crucified in a corner somewhere and hidden away from view. He was on display. The Apostle Paul even further develops that in Corinthians, that it's on display. And just because Jesus is on display, we, you and I are spectacles as well. We're on display. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love with, with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins and he quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm not physically there yet. This mortality has not taken on immortality, but that means my spot at the dinner table is reserved. It's set. See, we've got to understand something. Paul's setting us up for chapter 4 when it talks about the body of Christ and the work and the ministry of the Spirit. These things were planned ahead of time. If we show up, we got something to eat. If we show up in the body of Christ, we got, well, some people do something, but here at St. Paul, we got something. We got something to do. And so here, he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. In what? In Christ Jesus. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not the Vishnu, not the Bhagwan, Raha, Raha, none of that. In Christ Jesus. See, some people have faith, but they have faith in faith. What is the outcome of your faith? You know, the faith that you believe these chairs will support your weight. How do I know? You're sitting in them. You have a faith. Some of you have blind faith. You really believe someone's going to stop on the opposing traffic while you're going through that traffic signal. You have blind. <laughs> you, 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 have faith. you exercise it all day. But, oh, that's just natural. That's just common sense. It needs to be that way. You know, it's, it's why Jesus tells us to come to him as little children. Do you know little children are not intimidated by me? I'm back with the little kids and I'm watching them go through their rebellion and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just... Like this, like, <laughs> they're just like, and I go, it, it does nothing. They're not afraid of me. But the adults, I smile at some of you. What's he, what's he doing? What I do? I just, I look, no, I'm like, I, I, I just smiled. What, what do you mean by that? I just come as a little child. There's, there should be nothing intimidating there. So he tells us here, that in the ages to come, verse 7, in the ages to come, he might show his exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. <laughs> you guys catch that at all? We're going to develop it even more. Buck and I have been talking about it lately. We're even going to show the angels about God's wisdom. <laughs> that just blows my mind because we're going to judge the angels. But right now, that God could show his kindness to the world, you and I on display through Christ Jesus. Do we give God the glory? Remember, don't touch the glory, don't touch the gold, don't touch the girls, and for some of you, don't touch the guys, right? For the ladies there, right? And so we have this here, but he's raised us up for this. You know, what is the will of God? To, to show the kindness of God. Now, I didn't plan this with Buck. But that song, do, were you lying? Are you an heir to the kingdom? Are you forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Does that float your boat or not? I mean, is that true? I mean, you're like, oh, that's for some other people. That's just not for me. Crazy musicians, crazy lyrics, you know. And it's just like a Mary Poppins song. You know, warm little kittens and mittens and things like that. You ever hear the words of that song? That's scary. My, me personally, I think they just said, we don't have any words for this Mary Poppins song, and they went outside some crackhead. Mittens and kittens, mittens and kittens, mittens and kittens. And little, little, so these are some of my favorite things. I mean, I walk down the street, and I see people. These are my favorite <laughs> No. In the ages to come, that he might show exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us 
through Christ Jesus. I mean, you can't be prideful about this. You can't be arrogant about it. What do you, why do you even exist to show the kindness and the riches of God's glory? How do you even say that? You, you can't be prideful about it. But if I understand what God is viewing, and again, this is chapters 1, 2, and 3. We're going to be able to apply it in chapters 4. You have to believe it. You have to live it. You have to know it. You have to understand it so you can live out chapters 4, 5, and 6. Because if you, if you don't know this, then chapters 4, 5, and 6 will really mean nothing. It, it, they will be in an impossible list to accomplish. There is no way that you'll be able to do that. And many people try to look at chapters 4, 5, and 6 of Ephesians, and they just make the, their checklist. I've got to do this. I've got to submit. I've got to one to another. I've got to do... And you, and you just... i got to check, 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 check. Did that, did that, did that. Done! There's no way to live that out unless first you understand the mystery of God's will. And he makes it real plain to us. And that you know how forgiven you are. And that really, we're just saved by God's grace so we can demonstrate God's kindness. And we're going to see even the wisdom towards the angel there. Through Christ Jesus. Look at verse 8. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, for it is the gift of God. That's a gift. What, what can you do for the gift? You turn it down or you can accept it. But you can't earn it. You're nothing for it. It's a gift. That's, that's by the true nature of the gift. Look at verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Why do you think that verse is in there? Because you and I, if it's possible, if it's po- the world's already got it, but if it's possible... And God forbid Christian television exists and it goes on. They're going to have tweaked my salvation. They're going to be something where you can just trick it out and do all this stuff. And I'm going to tweak this and tweak that and do this. Now, how do I know? Because I'm a student of history. You know where choir robes came from? Because rich and poor would come to church and, and you'd have the wealth. So the whole thing was meant to put a robe on so you couldn't tell how the person was rich or poor. That was the whole invention. Do your own little uh, study of the choir robes. But man, have you seen choir robes? Little flashing stripes on and people start doing all kinds of stuff and they start, again, this outer garment was, which was to make everyone plain and so the glory would go to God in these choirs and all of a sudden they're putting all kinds of stripes and things on their choir robes and these things and building them up. We would. I know I, know I would. If I could get my hands on salvation, my own salvation, I'd tell you what I would do. And I would just... I do, but it's reserved and I have the promise of it and I must depend upon him and it's reserved for me in heaven. But because of the one who made the promise, I know it's a done deal. I can trust it by the one who's made the promise. It's reserved in heaven for me. So, but look at this. For by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. Oh, I love this word. It's poema. Workmanship, poema. It's where we get the word poem. We're his poem. We're his lyric. We're his, we're his work. We're his creation. We're his love song. We're, it's that work. It, it's, it's because of his hands and his crafting us. Trust me. A guitar in Buck's hands is a lot different than a guitar in my hands. I mean, last week alone, I won the banjo contest. I must have thrown that thing about 75 yards. You guys get that? It's something. I don't know if you ever heard Doug play the accordion. It's a lot different in his hands than it is in my hands. I've heard play the Doug, the accordion, Doug play the accordion, and I wanted to take it out of his hands and put it into my hands. But, but he loves the accordion. That man loves the accordion. You love the accordion, don't you? And why is it not a surprise? <laughs> he just, it's just him, man. It's just so, look, that's his workmanship. It's created in Christ Jesus to do what? Unto good works, which God hath beforehand ordained, before ordained that we should walk in him. Don't confuse God's sovereignty and his foreknowledge that you have no will and have no choice. God knows well ahead of time what we're going to choose and what we're going to do. And he has prepared good works for us to participate in. So when we show up, God is never waiting God is ready. And when we show up, 
He's got something for us to do. Out here, it's, it's something. That we should what? Walk in Him. When people ask, Jesus, what is the will of God? To believe on the one whom God has sent. That is the will of God. Can I build a wall? Can I erect something? Can I wreck something? Can I, you know, is it it's just, just believe? And that belief will cause right actions to happen. That belief will just cause us, because you believe, if you believe in that, your life will follow that way. If you truly believe that plane is going to crash, you're not going to get on that plane. If you truly believe death and destruction is going to come, you're not going to do that. If you truly believe these things are going to happen, you, you respond and act in such a way. This isn't Christianity. This understanding is not a blind leap of faith. I used to think that. I used to think like one of our former governors that religion was a crutch and it's for the weak and minded and those things. It's not a crutch. It's a whole hospital, man. I'm in intensive care. But when it comes to this, it's not a blind leap of faith because there is, again, an outcome. Not a faith in faith. There is an outcome. There is a direct result of my faith in Jesus Christ. Once eternal life, it's banking on him. But there's this other things. I mean, this world's better off that, that I'm a Christian now and my life has changed because there's, there's people alive. There's people who own things now that I haven't stolen. There's, there's lives that are no longer wrecked. These things are, th- there's a direct result because of my faith and there's an outcome of my faith that has produced something. And the will of God was to simply believe, and I believe the words of Jesus. I mean, there came a time when I said, I'm tired of church, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of that, I just, all this thing. I just went and got a red letter edition Bible and said, I'm just going to look at the words of Jesus. And I spent a year of my Christian walk just reading the words of Jesus. And I couldn't find any lunacy in them. I couldn't find anything wrong. And if anything, it corrected a lot of my perception, because perception could be someone's reality. It corrected my perception of all those things that aren't in there, that just don't happen that shouldn't happen, but that happened because of, well, you and I as Christians. Now, I've done things in the name of God and of Christ and, of, you know, church, and I thought it was the right thing to do. And that can be confusing people. But here's the thing. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath beforehand ordained that we should walk in him. If you're not serving, and this is going to play out more in chapter 4, but God hath ordained you beforehand to do good works. And he's going to equip you for it. He's going to equip you for it. And when you or I, when we're walking in our lives and we're not doing just these good works, we're not doing, and not what the world calls good works, but what God identifies, and we'll get more into that in chapters 4, 5, and 6. Then let that be an identifying mark that I might not be walking in obedience and I might be identifying with the children of disobedience. This is again. You take me to task on it. You read it. I'm not trying to read into what the Apostle Paul is saying. You just do your own inventory. Here's a child of disobedience. Here's one who has wrath upon him. And here's one who walks in obedience. Good works just happen. They just happen. Right relationship with the Lord causes right actions to happen according to God's word. For we are his workmanship. I'm created in him. And he's molding me. He's doing these things. Look at verse 11. Wherefore, remember. You ever get together with your family and play... I remember when, I, rem- I remember you, I remember, the- and you get together with the family, you play I remember, well Paul's our brother, and he's playing, do you remember, do you remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh were all called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands? That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants and the promise, having no hope and with, without God in the world. Do you remember that life? Do you remember what that was like? Here's a little reminder. Here's a little doctrine. Here's a little teaching. What really is going on in your life is all that bad. Do you remember? So again, this isn't Chick the Fanatic saying, do you remember you were going to hell? I've got to get together with you and pray, man. I'm really going through this trial. Are you going to hell? Because the Bible says, fear the one who can throw you into hell. Are you going to be thrown into hell later tonight? And like, you're making fun of me. I, yeah. And some people said you wouldn't catch it. Take a hint. I, all right. Are you going to hell? No. Okay, what's, okay, so you're not going to hell. You're not going to hell. Let's go to the bases. Your relationship with God makes you sure you go to heaven. When you die, yeah. Okay, what is it? <laughs> and you fill in the blank. <laughs> it's all the same. <laughs> Should I tell him? Should I tell him? He's probably... And they tell me, 
That's it? Ah, let's pray that one through. Let's, let's work that one out. You feel bad? Well, let's, Paul plays it. Do you remember? Do you remember that you had no hope? You have hope right now. Well, I don't feel like I'm, I have hope. Well, then obviously you're not living like you have hope. I mean, when it really just comes down, I mean, do, I would ask you to do this. Would just bosses yelling at something's happening? Th- these things are just happening. And I even try it with my wife. Well, you do this, you do that. But you love me. Just, stop it. I'm trying to correct this behavior. But you love me. It's not working, is it? But you love me. <laughs> you love me. He, he, he loves me. Who is, who is like our God? You had no hope. But now, I like that one. But, in times past, remember when, but now. Is this an identifying mark of you right now? But now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Did you hear that in the song? Puck, did you read ahead? I mean, this, these are the songs. I mean, by the blood of Jesus, he said, man, oh, praise God for that pagan luck that he did that song today. All right, just... <laughs> Uh, do you guys get this by the blood? Of, do you, not the blood. I mean the blood. Jesus, you have to die to pour out all your blood. He wasn't at the donation bank. He wasn't getting his donation check for donating blood. He, he was wrung out. It cost him everything. All of what? Blood. Everything. Do you forget that you were far off, but you were made nigh by the blood of Christ? For he is our peace who had made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. There is a wall. Yes, as a new ager, I believed all roads lead to God. And when I became a Christian, I found out that's true. All roads do lead to God. But only one road gets you past Jesus. One day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, that Jesus Christ is Lord. I think that would make a great song. (laughs) Look, verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. You got your list? You got your commandments? You got your various other things? What did the rich man say? What did the young ruler say? I've done all these things for my youth. Jesus didn't name all the commandments. He said, but yeah, but one thing you lack. Oh, could there be that one thing that I lack? And you fill in the blank for whatever that is. And he went away sorrowful. You see, he's making himself one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both us unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity, slain the enmity uh, thereby. The enmity, the, the hostility, the tensions. He is the peacemaker. He is making peace. And if we're not at peace with God, then we're at enmity. There's tension right there. And there's no going to be peace. There's not going to be satisfaction. There's not going to be contentment. God put a God-shaped hole in everyone, man, woman, and child's heart that it would never be filled except by a relationship. And that relationship is what? By the blood. Again, not Chick the Fanatic saying these things. Chick the Fanatic reminding you of what the Apostle Paul says. This blood. Not a donation bank blood. This blood that cost him everything. We may be nigh unto that. We've been brought close to him. Verse 17, and came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to them that were nigh. And remember, we even seen that with Jesus Christ. He preached to the lost. He taught his disciples. There is a time for preaching, folks. You're preaching. You're proclaiming. What? The good news. That Jesus Christ can save us from an ultimate eternity of hell. And he's going to not only that, take care of that salvation issue, but right here and now have peace. And I can know his will and obey it or disobey it. I can know his will and follow him, and he wants me to know these things. Do you get it that even in Hebrews tells us the patriarchs of old didn't even get what you and I have right now? You and I get the benefit of chapter 1 of Job. Job never had that. You and I already know there's an enemy who wants to take us down. He wants to rob, steal, kill, and destroy. He wants us out, out of the way. 
Paul even tells us, and Timothy even tells us, and 1 John tells us, what is it? Those who seek to live a godly life, what? You shall be persecuted. Jesus says they're going to hate you because they first hated me. They're not going to hate me because of you. They're going to hate you because of me, Jesus says. So having come and preached peace to you, which were far off, and to them that were nigh, for through him we both have access by one spirit, unto the Father. It's not having that relationship with just God the Father. It is through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said of himself, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except through me. This is what Paul's laying down for us. And we're going to be able to apply it out in the context in 4, 5, and 6 of Ephesians. Now. What do you think that means? No, way way later. Later. No, now. No, 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 later. I mean, I, I understand the Greek and the Hebrew and the Arabic and, you know, pig Latin. No, 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 it, later. When you're thinking about it. We had a little more time. I mean, you know, this is an emotional response right now. No, 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 we had the music going. I got butt going and stuff like that. And you're just right here. And I know that says now, but, you know, just take some time. No, now. Okay, all right. <laughs> Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with Lorne and Doug and Chick and Buck and with the saints. We'll talk later. Um, And of the household of God. All right, Hans? He gives me the impression he'll be there. but, But now, Hans... Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built up upon the foundation of the what? The apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Verse 21, in whom all, what do you think all means? All. Excellent Bible students there. And all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Yes, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, He's using us all and He's fitting us together. And we fit together. Jagged and ragged edges. We, you know, that's why God invented hammers. He puts us together. And we're there and we're going to be joint and fit. And He's going to smooth those edges. He's going to work those. We're His workmanship. And He's going to make, we're going to fit. You might be coming like, I don't fit right now. You will. Just start eating. You will. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Just, you just, what, what do I got to do? You just, you will. You will be fit and joined together. But first and foremost, chapters 1 and 2, and read ahead for ch- next week for chapter 3. Chapters 1 and 2. Do you know the mystery of God? It's not a mystery anymore. He wants to reveal it to you. Do you understand what the will of God is? To show his kindness because of Christ Jesus. The whole world, everybody. To demonstrate it. What is the will of God? To believe on him who sent me. To believe on the one whom God sent, Jesus Christ. And because of that, it's just going to happen. You don't have to quit anything to come to Christ. You preach that to others, but when they come to Christ, just smile. Because they're going to come to you, oh man, I, I no longer have enjoyment of that. Good. Good. I remember coming to my pastor saying, you know, I used to do this. I didn't think that was a problem. I just, I don't enjoy that anymore. He goes, Good. I don't want you to, I just, good. What are you going to do about that? Well, what am I going to do now? Well, you know, we're, we're hanging out here doing this, and we're going to go to that, and the body, once you get together, the body's going to fit together, and we're going to, oh, I don't think I, I, don't think I really fit. And they're like, oh. Can, can anyone really say that at Cabbage House? I really don't think I fit here. Really? <laughs> You're crazy, because, you, you know, I got glasses on, but even without them, I can see that we fit come together. It's Christ Jesus. And now we get an opportunity to pray and just have a time of afterglow of just waiting and responding to what God's doing in our lives here. So pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. And that God, that we can just walk in newness of life and know that we're no longer strangers. So therefore, we don't have to act like strangers. We're no longer foreigners. We're not. It's the body of Christ. It's the household of faith. And you're building us up to fit together. And there's some smoothing that needs to go on. And there's some refinement that needs to go on. And 
And so, Lord, I pray that you just do that work in our lives and you just build together Calvary Chapel St. Paul and that you would just do your work in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Buck's going to come up and uh, just do it. If someone's got a tongue, speak it out, but we need to wait for an interpretation. And just to remind you guys, because we haven't been doing this for the last few weeks, but remember, a tongue is between man to God. So if you feel like God has wanted to say something and someone speaks out in a tongue and you're speaking from God to man, it can be confusing. So if someone has a tongue, there needs to be interpretation. If it's not, two or three of the most. And if not, then we cease doing that. And, and, and if... I, I, I doubt very seriously that there's anyone here today that you haven't bitten someone with sin or sin has bitten you today. But if God's given you a word of knowledge that maybe someone here is dealing with some sinful issues, God's going to give you who that is. Go talk to them. But when you speak out, I believe there's sin in the camp. I already know there's sin in the camp. I showed up. And that just gets everybody nervous. So if God's going to show you something, just go ahead and do that. Just let him speak to you about that. And you can go talk to that person some other time. But I just want to hear from God what God would have for Calvary Chapel St. Paul. If you personally need prayer, come on over here. Lauren's going to move. And, uh, and come on over here, and, and I'll note you with oil, and we'll pray, and we'll just have a time, and however long it goes, it goes. But uh, let's, just, uh, let's just have a time of waiting on the Lord. Amen? Hey, women? All right, go ahead, bud. Get the lights there, Cass.